welcome to the latest reaction event for our subscribers. Uh, it's in support of our student program, providing training and opportunities for brilliant young um, journalists. We're also joined this evening by guests from the Speakers for Schools program. Uh, and thank you to our guest for tonight. We're going to be in conversation with uh, Danny Finkelstein, my uh, colleague from the, the Times. Welcome, Danny. Now, we're here to discuss this everything in moderation now copies signed copies are available from our friends at Haywood Hill in Curzon Street who can also mail out and Danny's going to be signing copies uh, there now uh, we'll email a link to everyone who's on the uh, on the call and uh, pass on the uh, pass on the details so firstly it's a fascinating book I really really enjoyed it um, it's a really bold thing to do to actually go back through all these all these previous columns. What on earth was that like? I, in a way, I can't think of anything worse than having to go back through predictions about politics and stuff. It's an absolutely fascinating book. Well, I didn't. I've always been rather against doing predictions anyway. So fortunately, I didn't go back and find that I was anticipating a lot of things that didn't happen. Um, there were one or two columns I went back on and discovered. I hold a view that was really stupid. Um, there was a horrendous column in which I argued after a particularly irritating leader conference at the Times that I didn't care whether Scotland was independent, um, which I really do care about. So I can't imagine what I was thinking of. Um, so there were a few like that. And there were others where I thought, well, that's a very good argument, but I wonder whether any reader will still remember those events. And a good example of that being Ruth Kelly um, and uh, her membership of Opus Dei. I didn't think very many people when I was writing about gay rights or whatever would understand, would remember who, maybe even who Ruth Kelly was, let alone mm. what would happen. So, um, so that I had to remove those, but it wasn't too discouraging an experience apart from that. I, I did decide to take quite a lot of care on it. And the reason for that was twofold. The first is, you know, that both the publisher and my agent both said don't just put a, a load of columns in chronological order um, because uh, that's not a good reading experience and so mm -hmm. right from the beginning I decided to organize it into sections and um, concentrate for example lots of different profiles of people like Walt Disney or David Bowie as well as yeah. John Major and William Hague and um, into one you know or, or even Gary Becker uh, the Nobel Prize winner all into one section um, and then essays on politics and um, essays on history you know into different sections and so I did that I thought that that worked better as a reading experience the other reason I did it was because I I read few through a few other people's collections of columns mm -hmm. and one of them was Boris Johnson's I was doing that for a slightly different reason I wrote a column about you know what did he think it was a very interesting experience but they weren't very good books he's not that he's mm -hmm. I mean he's obviously a great columnist uh, very witty and he's got a lot of verve and tackles on it and, and they're great to read but they weren't great to reread his books actually because first of all they were quite um they didn't last you know they were about the yeah, moment yeah. which was important but also he put, he just threw them all in, right? Whether or not they were, yeah. and 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 I realised that didn't quite work. So, um, the really, I put a lot of work editing into the book. That's that's that that's as a result of those two things. And that re that that really does work because you get that sense of some of those big themes we'll talk about um, talk about shortly about you know, the rise of the dominance of new labour and how new labour falls and Tory modernisation. So the way the way it's grouped together that that really does work it's interesting you say that about boris i think is that the book you're talking about is it lend me your ears or yes. it, it is yes you know it's the history thing isn't it it's one sort of one damn thing after another but also i suppose his columns and you're right he is a brilliant columnist but he he has a very particular style what when we were on the on the telegraph and i was on the, running the comment desk on the telegraph we used to talk of it as sort of boris shaggy dog story style that everything is is a sort of long meandering yeah. Boris story with lots of gags and things along the way. But one of the things I really like about your book is there's so much variation in the in the styles and uh, and styles and approaches. Now, your route to being a columnist at the Times was not a standard journalistic no. route. And I love the way in the book you in the, in the introduction the way you describe. I think beginning by reading 
yes. the Times, the back page, I think aged eight years old. Yeah. Um, and what draws you first to the Times? Well, um, my parents got copies of the Times. In fact, funnily enough, um, my mother always uh, very much liked the uh, the Times, the fact that I worked for it. And the other day I was reading um, an obituary of my grandfather, of her father, and his obituaries described him as the sort of person who believed that the Times was second only to the Bible. Um, and there was certainly a little bit of an attitude to that in my family. I think that was to do with being an immigrant family and yeah. um, the Times representing, you know, a national newspaper. So they, there was very much a sort of affection for that paper that, the, that my parents always had. And they had the paper. So I used to go down and read it in the morning to get the football, um, which I would, a subject I'm still sort of obsessed with. And um, you finished quite quickly reading the Times football in the 1970s. Um, uh, you know, one of the things about the, the sports section is it's all papers, actually. They're just so much richer, so much better. Mm -hmm. And a lot more upper middle class people who might want to read the news also want to read the, the sports news. And you have to be as good at that as you might one day at one time have been about ups and downs in the civil service. So the Times... Um, didn't have a big football section so I finished it quite quickly and then you know, my father hadn't come down for breakfast yet he hadn't reclaimed his newspaper and he kind of gently encouraged me to do this but I, I then ended up reading from the front and I, and I started reading about the Watergate scandal it was an amazing time to start reading it I mean my 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 youthful understanding of what actually happened wasn't that great as I discovered because we're still just I'm still reading books on Watergate and learning things even now about yeah. that extraordinary event and anyone it's one of the problems when you say there isn't such a thing as a conspiracy theory uh, as a conspiracy and they're all conspiracy theories is that this was a genuine conspiracy of an extraordinary kind but still yeah, and a complicated yeah. kind. But still, that led me all into into politics, reading reading the Times, and then I was in politics, uh, actually, you know, campaigning. But I've always had an interest in writing, uh, mm. reading, learning, analyzing. And what was uh, it? What was the, what was the thing that drew you to politics? Because when you get into politics, you you describe it in the book. You really, really get into it in terms of memorizing. Uh, you know majorities in uh, yeah. you know in, in the in the Times book survey of each general election, all of that sort of stuff. You become obsessed by. Look, there are two there are two things that I can give you a high answer and a low answer. Right, the low answer is a kind of nerdy thing. Once you become interested in it, anything, and you become the person who knows most about it, you kind of double up on it and you learn more about it. And there's lots of facts that you can learn. But the less nerdy thing is, um, you know, I'm a son of two refugees. My mother was in Belson. My father was in Siberia. And politics. They killed my grandmother. They stole my our property. They, uh, you know, down to the last spoon. Um, they, they, they st starved um, my mother, you know, almost to death. They exiled my father uh, to the wastelands of Siberia. Uh, you can't live in my family and think politics doesn't matter. And all three of us have ended up doing things that are of one form or another to do with public life and public engagement. So uh, my, myself and my, my, and my siblings. And so um, that I was always, my parents weren't excessively political in the party sense, uh, but they were, my father would particularly, actually both my parents were very interested in public affairs and they encouraged that interest in me. So those two things, the high and low uh, points really. Your parents are very, very important in this book, very, very important in your, uh, in your life. And the title of the book really comes from something yeah. that your your mother would say and I, I think really in relation to appetite Correct. and food and, uh, and 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 portions and all that and, and all that sort of stuff but it is the they're the beginning of your political philosophy or worldview aren't they yeah so i i i've sometimes people go uh you know moderation isn't just splitting things in the middle and it isn't just compromise and actually i don't i'm not worried about splitting things in the middle and compromising there's a quite a good thing sometimes um and so even the most um as it were uh um you know the weakest point in to be said about moderation that it sometimes involves um kind of you know taking a middle point between two wrong positions um even that i think has a big advantage because part of the purpose of a stable politics is to ensure that everybody feels that this is a law they can just about keep um, and so I'm, I have that, um, uh, so 
I'm a moderate in that sense. Uh, but I also am a moderate because I believe that um, the sort of peace and stability of what one might call bourgeois institutions are worth defending. I also believe very much in concrete, um, gradual uh, reforms in small steps rather than big sweeping abstract ideas. I think most big ideas um, are, are, are wrong. Um, and even when they're not wrong, uh, that it can be dangerous to leap towards them without some sort of experimentation along the way. Um, now, there are, of, there are other people can use different ways to describe this. I'm definitely a small C conservative in lots of ways. Um, but because I, I don't use that term because I believe that um, capitalism and science and the Enlightenment together are leading to human progress that we learn all the time. Uh, and so there's an element of me that is a progressive, but of the gradual moderate kind. Mm. And so therefore I prefer moderate to small C conservative. So your, your, fa your father is a, is originally is a labor person, or was a, was a labor voter, loved Harold, Harold Wilson. Yeah. Easy to forget, easy to forget that lots of people actually did. And that yes. Harold Wilson really had his, had his followers. So he, he hated, or disliked the uh, the Labour left, anything to the left of Wilson. But when you get into politics uh, as a young man, you jo you don't you I mean, you go to the SDP. Yeah. So the, the the important thing, and I only understood this when I was when I was writing. It's, there's an essay on it in the book, an article, uh, which relates, which is published just before David Cameron's election in 2010, yeah. when I talked about class and voting. Um, the thing about my family is we haven't really got a class background in this country, right? We don't come from here. My grandfather, uh, bo on both sides, their background, yes, it probably was middle class in their own countries, but but being Jewish complicated that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, my father came to this country and he supported Harold Wilson because of planning, being an engineer and planning. Um, but, n but the Labour Party's class base was pretty unintelligible to him in right. addition to which socialism having been um you know uh, a prisoner of stalin was not as you might imagine particularly attractive mm -hmm. uh, to him so um i i i those so when that election in 2010 a lot of the people in that election were saying you know my grandfather would roll in his grave if he knew i was thinking of voting conservative that whole you know my grandfathers were in their graves for completely different reasons and they they uh you know, they probably weren't rolling in English, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So they, 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 it wasn't easy for me to sometimes to relate, you know, to one of these major uh, parts of people's political identity. And that was also definitely true of my parents. And so David Owen is then a big influence. So you, and you, you're yeah. part of that group, that small group that moves from the SDP yes. directly into the, into the Tory party. That, so that, wasn't, Owen, that wasn't a difficult choice because, because you'd always believed in markets. Yeah, look, so I, I kind of, the SDP hits the buffers in, in, uh, the, after the 1987 election, and I didn't want to join the Liberal Party for a couple of reasons. One was, um, I did, did not, I thought of the, the, I thought and believed the Liberal Party saw itself as part of the left. Uh, they constantly uh, pra praising themselves on being radical and things like that, which is not a word I'm particularly attracted to. Um, mm. And I, and I didn't take it, I didn't regard it as serious force, despite the fact that I'm quite sympathetic to a lot of the, pe you know, to a lot of people in it. Um, I think they're kind of well-meaning and I relate to them, but I just don't, I didn't regard it as a serious political party. Also found it often a bit up itself. Um, and um, I found that, you know, there each political party has different failings and that was theirs, a bit <laughs> unctuous. Um, so I wasn't attracted to joining them and I, also thought, you know what, the SDP has failed partly because uh, it's trying to succeed in an electoral system, which means it can't succeed. So what's the point of doing this again? Um, and the other thing was that I realized I was trying to be right wing on the left, okay? I'd, 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 I was basically supporting privatization, um, 
trade union laws, opposing the miners' strike. A big issue for me was CND. It was opposition to CND, mm-hmm. and it, all, all, all the time, my alliance alliances ended up being with people on the centre right, not on the centre left. So when when the SDP finally finished, that wasn't. It was obvious to me that's what I needed to do next. It was a bit culturally surprising. I'd not really thought of myself as a Tory. And even now, sometimes I find myself sort of a fish out of water in uh, in Tory events, despite the fact that I've like been a Tory candidate, the advisor to several Tory prime ministers, the head of the Conservative Research Department. So I kind of I belong there as much as anybody else. Mm. But it, there is a little bit culturally that of, in me that's definitely different. What do you find odd about the Tory party? Oh, that is a different question, which I hope you weren't going to ask. It's difficult <laughs> to put my finger on it. But I mean, I, I guess um, Nikki, with my wife, would, would kind of say um, they're kind of... Uh, she, I once remember going to... We went to visit some very posh uh, friends. They were lovely people. And as we left, uh, Nikki said to me, we're their Jewish friends. And I knew what she meant exactly. Uh, but she'd probably kill me for saying all this. But anyway, um, but she knew what she meant exactly, Bobby. So there's something definitely um, when the Conservative Party gets together that isn't quite me. Um, but that may be just political parties, actually. I, I pe- There's a sense of rightness about all political organisations where everybody thinks we're right and the other people are completely stupid that I can't hold. Um, and and so it may not be the Tory party itself. But so you you then work for John Major as yeah. when he's prime minister, and yeah. you you go through that whole nineteen nineties experience leading up to yeah, uh, leading up to rather spectacular general election result in nineteen ninety six. I mean, I was in central office Ian, on the night of the nineteen ninety seven general election. If you there are pictures of John Major arriving in central office um, in in. Uh, and I think of it as raining, even though obviously it wasn't, uh, it was May, but um, I'm standing on the doorstep waiting for John uh, to to come back to central office. And it was just amazing. I'm standing next to William Hague and one person after another is losing their seat. And I'm realizing William, you know, then stood a pretty good chance of being leader of the Conservative Party, but wasn't, didn't show that on his face, which I discovered was characteristic. Um, but uh, yeah, it was quite an experience that evening. Because he's in that, I think you're in that footage with H- Haig and Portillo are the, are the welcoming party, aren't they? There's, there's Haig and Portillo and some senior yeah, stuff. I mean, yeah. They I mean, have to stand there just waiting for him yeah. with the, the camera train, trained on them. Did you know it was going to be that bad? Did you know it was going to be that bad? Um, so I, I, I did kind of know it was going to be bad. So it was going to be... Uh, we, I discussed with David Willits, would this be as bad as 1906 or as bad as 1945? We got as far as that. We didn't think it would be as bad as 1832, which is what yeah. it was. Um, so no, I didn't. Or, is, or, or actually, or as good as 1945, as some Labour supporters are watching this will be saying. <laughs> we're we're yeah. assuming that it's bad, but yeah. yeah I mean, I'm, I'm talking obviously for the people who worked in central office. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, but I, the, the oddest thing was being outside the national mood at that moment. I'm a great believer that, and there's, a, there's an, an article about that in this in the book as well, um, that the electorate gets things right in elections, um, that it chooses the most fit to govern party. And standing back from it, it was quite obvious that in 1997, um, Blair both could and frankly should win the election. The Conservative Party had been in power for 18 years. It had run out, it, it exhausted its agenda and also its ability to govern itself. Um, and um, it will, and you know, you get into a position where people have been in power too long and then the gr- people become complacent and corrupt. And I think that is, that's why a democratic system has turnover. So, um, but obviously when you're working for central, in central office and you're a conservative, you don't, you can't see it like that. And I didn't. Um, and uh, it was very odd those next few days being outside the national mood where everybody was, you know, delighted and relieved that Tony, I mean, I say everybody, but this this vast wave of enthusiasm. And even those people who hadn't voted for Blair were then sort of released by the fact that he'd won this huge majority. I mean, the one thing that held John Major to in place in the last few days of the campaign was people's slight misinterpretation of the size of the coming landslide. And if they'd realised, yeah. if they'd realised what was coming, it would have been even worse, I think. 
Yeah, I was, I've all, in fact, I've never asked you this before, but I've always wondered why in the just jumping elections. And it's a really good point you made there, and that I really like that article about being outside the national mood because you cite the Diana week, which is one of the weirdest weeks in the history of this uh, country. And I, like you, felt very much outside the national mood. And then MPs' expenses in yeah. 2009, where you just couldn't get as worked up as uh, as most people about it. But the question I was going to ask you about the, the 2001 election, you're then working for William Hague. Yes. Someone who you're convinced is would make a good prime minister. Yeah. Uh, you're convinced of his merits. But that it's no use. Yeah. The so country, the country, the, co the country, for whatever reason it is, can't can't see him, uh, can't see it. And there's then it's all it's almost it's almost as though the electorate, which doesn't think is one, of course, but large numbers of people think that Labour's only really just started. Yeah, that's true. They they were elected with a massive majority, and they're halfway through a program. Let's give them yeah, uh, give them backing. Why didn't Hague? And I remember this at the time. There was there were rumours, and I remember being involved in writing a story about about it. That there were people floating the idea that he should almost concede, and in the final days have flipped to stop, you know, try and put a break on New Labour, at least vote for a strong opposition, which he almost did, didn't he? Do you remember on the nine o'clock or ten o'clock news, it was trailed as him. Yeah, sort of conceding, and it did, and it didn't. And it, it, I very, always wondered whether it would have worked. Well, it's an extremely difficult thing that particular trick. Um, so uh, that John Major, we also had that kind of thing where we put the election off, or John did, um, mm. hoping it would get better. And of course, the longer it went on, the worse it got. And what you really need to do was actually go soon, um, reduce the size of the defeat, um, and. Um, but that involves ex sort of accepting nothing's going to come along and save you from this. And it's yeah. really difficult to do particular. Um, and so, and, and the part of the problem is if you say we're definitely going to lose, um, but let's reduce the size of the majority, it can have the effect of making things worse um, because people, you get a bandwagon effect and people think, well, nobody's voting for this guy. So I'm certainly not going to vote for him. Yeah. Uh, so it wouldn't necessarily have worked, but I don't, you know, I think, interestingly enough, given that I feel that William Hay often was very good tactically, um, I don't think strategically the Conservative Party approached the 2001 election very well. Uh, you know, I'll put it lightly. Yeah, yeah. So then Haig loses and you, you embark on a, a career at the, at the Times. Mm. You, you describe it very nicely about being so, being so excited. Yeah. Um, well, it was, it was interesting because just at the you know end of working for Make, I then had various different job offers, some commercial, some working in the Jewish community, actually, and then some uh, and then this one from The Times. And I just remember sitting in the time in the reception area of The Times, waiting for my meeting with Peter Stovart, the editor, uh, and um, Anatole Kaletsky, who was a columnist at that time, walked through. And I suddenly had this feeling of that is actually where this is where I want to be. This is what I want to be doing. And also, it's probably my strength. I sort of perceived it. At that point, I actually hadn't written that much. I had worked as a journalist, but, you know, my columns were about multiplex as I was a, I was a computer journalist. So I hadn't, and I'd written a few columns of an indifferent, one or two good ones, but mostly indifferent for the times. But I had a sort of instinct that I might be quite good at doing it. Mm. Um, and uh, that was an you know, it was an amazingly correct thing. I, I've absolutely loved doing it. Mm. I've loved every day that I've worked on that paper. Mm. Um, and so without any question, the decision to join the Times, which ultimately, P Peter saw that a funny thing, he rang me up and he said, um, we, you know, we'd like to offer you this job on the Times. He'd already said that he wanted to, but he had to check because he had a hiring freeze and he, re he removed the hiring freeze for me. And uh, that's why he had to ring me. And he said, he, he rang me and said, um, you know, we decided to do this and uh, we'd like you to join. Um, and I've also decided that you want to run for parliament and I wouldn't normally take on someone who wants to do that, but I'm willing to do that for you. Um, he said, partly because I don't think once you join the Times, you're going to want to run for parliament. And I remember through my head was going the idea, that's completely wrong, I will want to do that, but fine. So I said, great, you know, no problem, I'll do it. And uh, he was right. 
<laughs> it cured you of wanting to be an MP. Well, it didn't. Yeah, it did. I, well, what happened was that um, I slowly but surely sort of began to develop on time. I got this column. I suddenly thought to myself, well, working for Peter Stoddard on Robert Thompson and Rupert Murdoch is like, this is better than both working for the electorate, surely. Um, the, uh, the uh, you know, the, 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 apart from that, they're paying me more than I can pick my own topic. I don't have to, I can decide what I think rather than responding to what they think. Um, and I can still enjoy the engagement in public affairs while being beholden to no one. And, you know, one time I was in Pinna, where I live, and I went to drop my son off at our synagogue. Um, and as I was coming for a class, and as I was coming out, I bumped into Nick Hurd going in. And Nick Hurd was about to attend a service too boring for me, the member of the synagogue and Jewish to attend, right? Because he was the MP on a Saturday morning. I mean, what was his family doing, right? And um, so, that's the, I think sometimes we don't realise just what a slog being a member of parliament is. I've got huge respect for it. And I think in many ways it would have been a wonderful thing to do. Uh, but for all sorts of reasons, I got, I got um, you know, being more serious for a second, for all sorts of reasons I got embroiled with what I was doing at the time. So I often tell people who are thinking of becoming members of parliament, you have the talent to do it. Um, the one person who can stop you at this point is you deciding that you no longer want to do it. If you want to do it, get on with it before you get something else really interesting and you get hooked on that and never go back. And that is really what happened to me. I still have great respect for being a member of parliament and it would yeah. have been a great thing to do. I mean, one of, one of the things you, you hear a lot when you write about politics is that people say, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't we hope that our politicians will They'll go off and they'll do something else first until they're 45, 50. They'll run a business, run a hospital, do something productive. And then having learnt those lessons, they will then become MPs and, and, and apply them, which is, I mean, maybe that's changing now. But historically, that's not really the case. Most of the greats have uh, wanted to be politicians absolutely from the start and have tried to get into the commons at the earliest available opportunity and very often then had up and down careers if it's you know Thatcher fought for a long time uh, you know Callaghan's career as a minister was was erratic and had to resign as chancellor right. um, and then but that experience that sort of 30-year journey is then what made them prime ministers. Oh. The whole Farage Oborn theory about the rise of the political classes is historically rubbish, right? It's just not, we have never in our history had less, right, of a political class running uh, in politics, even though there's a lot of it, right? Um, and that is just simply because lots of people, you know, who became prime minister, I mean, obviously Pitt famously was prime minister by the time he was 24, but lots of them didn't do anything else other than go in into parliament. And one of the reasons I ran for parliament when I was 23, which I did, was because Roy Jenkins told me to. Uh, he said that, um, uh, you know, while well, I did it, and you know, and, and you know, it didn't do me any harm. Is his, is his general point, but uh, we, you know, which is which is kind of quite amusing. Um, and I, I write in the book about his extraordinary life in politics and how anyone can think that we're sort of there's less of an kind of enclosed political class. And he was he was after all sleeping with the wives of prominent. Uh, lay, uh, yeah. liberal and conservative members of parliament and all six of them including his wife and the other MP they all knew it right uh, and um, you can't imagine that happening now so the the I am of the um, yeah I'm of the view that 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 in many ways politics is sort of more open but there's another point which is there's a reason why people with political backgrounds often do well one of them is talented people who who don't um have gone off into other things begun to enjoy themselves and never come back uh and the other is that you gain a lot of experience when i when i ran or george osborne so george osborne's a close friend of mine because we were advisors together you know no one's saying to me that george's experience of writing speeches doing press releases dealing with the shadow cabinet we were joint secretaries of William Hague's the shadow cabinet but that doesn't produce political skill of course it does so you 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 then have a skill that say I mean one of the people I I, I think this is a man is an awesome individual is Archie Norman I learned a huge amount from him when he worked in central office and I I think he's brilliant um but without any quick 
question as a politician he wasn't as brilliant as he is as a businessman because that, that is was, really that is so brilliantly diplomatically put i remember John archie we did this event once and um it was central office was we're answering the questions and there was already a so you should you should you should explain this so he's a business a, a great business yeah. figure of his age right. brought in to overhaul the conservative party having been um ceo of asda he's now chairman of marks and spencers he's chairman of itv um and a brilliant businessman and he very he was anyway but i remember he was mp for tunbridge wells and he chaired this big event and the party members were asking questions and he would he was chairing it and he kept sort of going right well we'll have a question now yeah the lady with all the shopping bags on the front um what's your question she would ask a question he would go oh no i don't think that's a very good question <laughs> and i'll get someone else anyway they got more and more angry with us on the platform uh and afterwards i said to him you know i may not be a very good politician actually but this good i am i'm never doing going to be on a panel which you're chairing um and he but, but, but let me say you know he was utterly brilliant and it was true actually he did bring to politics um things that politicians didn't have but he also lacked certain political skills it was very interesting you know i i think um he was in many ways he he could claim to be one of the first people involved in modernization he used to always talk about how asda worked on providing the best uh basic goods like ham sandwiches and what was our equivalent to that and he was quite challenging to the ways that we did things and the ways that we thought and i learned a massive amount from him and and i think a lot of what david cameron then did owe itself a little bit to the foundations he laid so he did bring things it's true but he wouldn't have been any good by himself because he needed people who also had political experience so it's yeah. a mix you want yeah the, the the problem with the business person in 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 politics i always think is that the assumptions and the incentives are just completely different so if you're if you're in business and you're running a business your assumption would be you said employees and have five thousand people or something that people at the management level and at board level are broadly, other than maybe in a spectacular round of infighting, are broadly pulling in the same direction and want the same thing. They want the company to be more profitable and to be growing and to be employing more people and be more successful. They might squabble a bit about the, the tactics, but politics isn't like that. You no. can, around the cabinet table, table, as lots of prime ministers have discovered, people can sort of smile and nod and then leave the room and do the opposite. So one of the one of my favourite essays in the book or, or articles in the book is um, is on game theory and dissent yeah. in political parties. That we all we always had this idea that people who dissent um, are behaving like they're, they're lunatics, right? But that's because everyone assumes that the uh, that, that, that the interests of the centre are the interests of all the individuals, and that's not true. No. Uh, and so sometimes it's completely rational to defect, as people do in a prisoner's uh, prisoner's dilemma. We'll talk about Boris Johnson in a minute. Um, so we're, we're here this evening talking to Danny Finkelstein about everything in moderation. Uh, email everyone who's on the call with details of how you can get a signed copy uh now just want to talk a bit about it lead on to brexit do you know it's, it's actually it's 34 minutes we've been talking and we haven't mentioned covid which is great but i've now just jinxed that and we have mentioned it but let's talk first um about a major theme that runs through the book is the theme of tory modernization where we have similar instincts in certain senses but we've you know, disagreed politely yeah. down, down the years about modernization and how it uh, and how it works how does it look to you now the sort of 15 the 20 year span because it it worked in one sense in that we're both old enough to remember when it was in 98 99 people would open you know genuinely would write columns and have discussions saying will the tory party ever be able to form a majority government again mm -hmm. and is the tory party finished and will it be replaced by something by something else and then it did in 2015 david cameron won a majority so in that sense it's a vindication of your approach but then simultaneously simultaneously partly because of europe but also culture i would i would argue the electorate changes and a new kind of Tory winning coalition emerges in 2019 out of 2016, which is 
more working class, quite different, quite different from the, the kind of electorate that you were trying to appeal to when oh, you okay. and Michael Gove and David Cameron and George Osborne okay. were clustered around talking about how to save the Tory party. Yes, so I would say a number of things. For my first interest in the in, in Tory modernization was to create a Tory party that I agreed with more, right? Yeah. Uh, it, wasn't a le- it wasn't a purely electoral thing. Um, I, I believe strongly in gay, in gay rights, for example. I wanted the Conservative Party to share that view. I, I'm quite, in many ways, quite socially conservative on things like marriage, for example, which I believe is a very important, you know, an institution uh, that's very important to, to, to shore up. And um, I also believe very strongly in, um, you know, in uh, the kind of social institutions of the country and not necessarily undermine. I'm quite conservative in, in, in some ways, but I, but I wanted the Conservative Party to have a liberal outlook to people's individual rights and, um, and to be sort of uh, progressive in outlook in that way on things like race or sexism or, um, or, or gay rights. Uh, so, uh, and I also wanted it to be, um, to be a party that wasn't fixated with, wasn't purely fixated with tax rates, but also had a clear message on the improvement of public services and social provision, um, which I felt were, were issues that were important. So in that sense, um, so part of modernization was about making the Conservative Party into a party that was a moderate Conservative Party that, it, that accepted an ameliorated progress. Right? Um, and that was so that was part of the argument. Um, part of the argument, though, was electoral. Um, I, I believe, and I still believe, uh, that, that, that the Conservative Party needs two things to win elections on a strong basis. One is to, um, to be in tune with the country that's, as it develops. Uh, and the second is to be seen as moderate and uh, reasonable and in the mainstream and therefore ready to govern. Uh, and, um, I, and I still think those are important, uh, important things. Um, I, I accept that uh, winning the Brexit um, uh, referendum, um, the, the, the result of the Brexit referendum, opens up a new audience to the Conservative Party uh, that I think is um, likely to, you know, that's likely to last for a while and makes it harder to win other votes. Um, but it, my view is that the country is gradually becoming uh, more liberal, more diverse and more urban. Um, and if the Conservative Party moves in the other direction, it will in the long term be moving away from where its voter base is. And it'll also end up with a, a political party that's sort of, um, that, that might be caught with a kind of dying group of voters really. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that I think is a mistake. Um, and secondly, um, the, the, the modern Conservative Party is schizophrenic over its attitude towards modern moderation. Part of the message of the Conservative Party I'm really comfortable with. I believe levelling up is really correct. Um, I, I, I love the tone of Rishi Sunak and often Boris, actually. Um, I, I am um, completely at, uh, at ease with the idea that uh, the way of achieving fiscal conservatism which I'm very which I think is very important it's part of stability and something that I think the Conservative Party must stand for that the way of achieving that will probably be not will probably not be through uh, further spending cuts um, so lots of things the Conservative Party is doing I think a moderate I'm also I think we should respond to public feeling about immigration um, I uh, believe that uh, we must embrace progressive social change but this blind, uncritical, or, or in fact, critical theory ideas uh, are often, which have often come with a dogmatic language, such as ludicrous ideas like defunding the police have to be resisted. So in that way, I, I think those things are moderate conservative outlook, but sometimes um, the other voice is, um, you know, we must, uh, let's, uh, we're going to win the next election with a culture war. Um, we're going to, uh, campaign against the ECHR despite the fact that we've been doing it for years and we've never done anything about it you know we're going to sort of uh, get rid of the Supreme Court and we don't need to obey the law and uh, international treaties we sign don't need to be signed and uh, we're going to attack supreme justices through Tim Shipman uh, that is doesn't attract me um, and um, and it's not my politics so uh, 
it's schizophrenic and i'm you know i i don't want that to sound as though i because i i think there are lots of things that dominic cummings believed that i think were good things right i think he's right about science he was right challenging whether the civil service was sufficiently accountable and sufficiently people kept their jobs long enough to be accountable and stable i think he was right about that i think he and i think um he obviously was right about leveling up and he was a very good electoral stra election strategist but i certainly hope that one of the results of the changes in town downing street will be a slight change in tone again for the two reasons i think it's better for winning elections mm -hmm. personally uh but conveniently it's also what i think uh and i'm more comfortable with it sometimes <laughs> The difficult things in politics yeah. when those things go in opposite directions obviously we've got loads of questions uh coming in and you can ask a question in the q a um function and we've we've also got questions emailed in earlier um and we, question question there just you you let's talk about boris just for a second because you raised something which is baffling to me but maybe it's a question of character or boris's confidence or lack of i'm not sure that it did surprise me post-election and i i agree with you cummings has cummings has uh, strengths as a, as a as a strategist and as and a, a, as a campaigner but it did surprise me that, that that boris didn't do the rather obvious thing straight after the election which was to say thank you it's been terrific now go and write your book about disruption, disrupting organizations and history and Bismarck and science, go to Stanford, make a fortune, be Dominic Cummings, the, um, the media star, which I think would have happened. And instead, Boris says, no, stay. And the story, it, it, it's of course, COVID-19 is in the middle of that story, but it is, it's a very odd way to begin his premiership when he could have or, or to begin his premiership with a proper yeah. majority but I, I did anticipate that he would say it's now time for a slightly different kind of politics unite the country but he doubled down on the Cummings thing why I think there's a lot of things I, one of the things that can't be ignored is um, human relationships right so he's yeah. worked with this guy they've won an election together um, and um, there's probably a degree of affection and um, certainly on Boris's part um, and um, I think he also, uh, he likes to be liked. I don't think he'd have wanted to say, you know, a friend of mine, um, as you're aware, as somebody you know too, who once was working for Boris and he was taken out for lunch by him and he couldn't really understand what on earth he was being told or what the conversation was about. And then later somebody came in and said, when are you leaving? And he realized he'd been fired. Um, and that is, that is Boris. Um, for good or ill right? and i think that that's part he's just not very good at that kind of conversation um and uh the other thing is i i guess dominic cummings had quite a lot to offer and the bigger the, the more the more sort of odd que question is why is somebody as talented as an intelligent as him so unaware of you know how he maybe he's unconcerned about it how he deals with other people so and 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 it's surprising he couldn't regulate himself and realize he was in a different job and in a different era and that surprised me a number of people nick timothy that all surprised me as well i just didn't understand i don't understand why it's necessary to behave and treat people like that and why they people think it will work and these are all people that i actually quite like and have not you know personally i've got nothing um no bad experiences in any case with those people but lots of people have and it's been a problem yeah the, the the portrayal in the Benedict Cumberbatch film is actually re really rather good. Do you know the really do you know a really bad confession? So I haven't watched that. <laughs> I tell you why I haven't watched it. politics and you haven't watched it. I really no. recommend it. There's a there's a ton no, of stuff about know. about numbers and um, I, uh, and data and stuff which I would just just ignore that. But the, the, there are two political fiction has two problems for me. Either it's completely accurate. And I already know everything in it, or it's, <laughs> or it's inaccurate, and it drives me mad. <laughs> okay, let's have some uh, questions. So Andrew Wilshire asked a really good question: the success of the Conservative Party in 2019 and of Leave in 2016. 
cannot be separated, surely, from the election of Corbyn as leader of the opposition. How would the Conservative Electoral Coalition have evolved with a more mainstream la Labour leader opposite? Good question. Yeah, hi, Andrew. Um, yeah, I, I think that's correct. Um, and um, so the interesting thing is, to what extent was Corbyn's election, uh, you know, part of the same process of kind of um, people feeling that that um, that the centre wasn't offering them great more prosperity and I think probably it was probably an aftershock of the financial crisis that all three of those things happen and they're probably related to each other uh, definitely um, when the when the, the Labour Party moving to the left created an opportunity for the Conservative Party to be more buccaneering in uh, you know pleasing itself but I and I do probably think I probably think if Corbyn was not leader of the Labour Party, probably, probably the Brexit referendum would have been won by Remain. Actually, I do think that because it was pretty narrow. And I think a feature in it was people not knowing as Labour voters what they were supposed to do. So, yeah, I think it might have been a bit different. And, it, you know, without Brexit, it would have affected the Conservative coalition. Um, but then you have to ask yourself where all these things um correlated with each other you know because because Corbyn's uh election was caused by dissatisfaction with the kind of Blairite centre yeah so Gary asks a uh, good question under the leaderships of May and Corbyn both parties are divided around Brexit obviously values culture leadership style and there was uh, briefly, well, it actually seemed to go on for years, talk of a, there being room for a substantial centrist third uh, third party. Do you think that now Brexit's done, not sure it is done yet, um, and Johnson and Starmer, is, 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 there a, is there still, a, is there an opportunity for a moderate centrist alternative or is it gone? No, I didn't think there was at the time. And I said that. Um, the electoral system, we've got a two part, we've got a two, an electoral system that rewards heavily being in two political parties um, and um, under a proportional system you could have a di different arrangement but I think it's very difficult and the problem is who is the um, who is the base for this centre party right what what when people were saying people were going to leave the Labour Party to create what a new Labour Party which appealed to the Red Wall seats or a new Liberal Party that appealed to Richmond upon Thames and I think that um, they never really, I think that, by the way, that's still an issue for Keir Starmer to decide what he wants to be. But uh, but it's but it, this new party never decided whether he wanted to be Chukka Ramuna's new party or John Mann's. And it never, it didn't know. Um, and so therefore it, it wasn't going to get created. And I didn't ever, no, I didn't think that you were going to get this big, um, you know, the, I think there were, there were lots, by the way, of also things that stop it, which are people would have to, loop, you know, potentially lose their seats because they'd, be they'd, be they'd end up being the wrong party for that seat so you end up being in a new liberal party fighting mm. the red wall seat for example or in a new labor party fighting richmond upon thames it doesn't work necessarily yeah starmer's in a really odd situation isn't he because on on the one hand partly for the reasons you you just described labor part the labor party's in a in, in a relatively strong position where it can recover so it has, I've, I've always maintained it has, even despite every, all the catastrophe of Corbynism, the Labour residual brand, mm -hmm. for want of a better term, not a term I really like in politics, but um, the Labour brand and identity has a lot of strength, particularly in England. Yeah. Um, the weakness now is that that seems to have disappeared completely in Scotland and that Labour has been successful in winning elections only when it has a big, uh, you know, a large number of seats in Scotland, which I, I can't see that happening anytime soon. So, so Labour has become becomes weirdly a more English, more English party. Oh, how, do you you how do you think he's doing? I don't know whether it's me or you. I lost you for a second, Ian. No. I don't know if that was me or um, you. I just say, I'm just saying, how do you think Starmer is doing? Um, okay, um, so uh, let me just make sure that I'm on the right kind of connection. Yeah, I go. So um, I, I did hear most of your question. Um, so the the answer is, uh, 
I think that he's still got quite a lot of big choices. Uh, what coalition, what electoral coalition he wants to put together, uh, whether he wants to be uh, the leader of Liberal Britain or whether he wants to try to win back um, traditional Labour seats. Uh, there is quite a big gap that separates those. Uh, it's bigger for the Labour Party than it is for the Conservative Party, which is why Brexit caused it such a lot of trouble and it caused the Conservative Party less trouble. Um, uh, when people said the Conservative Party was split over Europe, it was often like the leadership against all the voters and members. Um, uh, you know, certainly was the case under John Major when, you know, because Ken Clark and Michael Hesler had one view on the Euro and actually everyone else didn't want the Euro. Um, so uh, it wasn't, you describe it as split was probably not a good description. Mm -hmm. The Labour Party has a voter split, which is much more serious. And I think he doesn't, he hasn't yet made a big choice, but you can do a lot by being more credible as a potential alternative prime minister and riding it's time for a change. I think it's time for a change will be one of the big things the Conservative Party faced at the next election. And on the issue of legacy, which you started with, you know, one of the things that I, a friend of mine, Jonathan Haskell, who's a, a professor, um, he, he sent me this brilliant paper about the Black Death and how areas which had pogroms against Jews during the Black Death in Germany, because they blamed the Jews for the plague, um, were highly correlated with the vote for the Nazis in the 1930s local elections. Um, and um, the, uh, over, in other words, over 600 years, people hadn't changed their politics, right? Um, and um, I think that's also true of this kind of legacy issue with Labour. People don't think a lot about um, politics and and, it, and their reactions are quite predictable sometimes, you know, to things. And um, anybody who enjoys, I, I really enjoy Gogglebox. I think it's fantastic. It's the, it, is the, it is the key political programme. Whenever right. politics is covered, covered, that is politics Correct. in the raw and how it's perceived in the country. Absolutely. And, and focus groups are also, you know, just as another form of goggle box, but people are not following that closely. So yes, um, if you kind of set up, people don't know who Chuka Ramuna is, you know, if he's going to set up another political party, right? So so that's a part of the problem. So my view is, yeah, Keir Starmer is a serious, uh, has a serious chance. The problem is Labour's so far away from the majority and he has to navigate this issue of how you deal with the SNP, but then so does Boris, so. Yeah, yeah, because you, you uh, I must, while you remind me, must um, highlight those when you get the book. My favourite column in the book is the Martin Freeman column. Oh, thanks. Which goes to the heart of that Labour question. You, you should describe it because it's, it's, it yeah. was the, possibly the most annoying, um, uh, you know, political advert or political party broadcast of that particular campaign. So he basically said, he didn't even basically say, he said, I think I've got the quote right. He said, my parents brought me up to be a good person. And that was basically why he was going to vote Labour. And so my piece was, my, I wrote him an open letter. And I said, um, well, it's fine, but you think my, did you, are you saying that you think I'm, um, I've betrayed my parents or that my parents were terrible parents, which is the choice, right? Or might it just be that we have a disagreement about how to achieve good things, you know, and what the proportion is. And it's amazing to me, that's so much a part of people's psyche that occasionally I've tried, and I, I mustn't do this again, actually, ever, on Twitter, to kind of make the obvious common sense point that this is not a div the political divisions are not nest you know are not necessarily divisions between nice people and people who aren't nice but divisions between people about how to set about being nice right and what is a good thing to do right and and by and sometimes being nice involves being firm or not like shattering the country with billions of pounds of debt and things like that those are also nice things uh, and um whenever i've tried it it's been a miserable failure in fact, you just get loads of people saying, no, you really are. Have you never thought that the real thing is you really are horrible? <laughs> absolutely nowhere every time I've tried it. But it, but it's so I have got to stop doing it. But I find it very frustrating to, and I think that article did work because it was getting, it was, I think Martin Freeman was probably very nice. And he thinks of himself as being very nice, which he probably is. But, you know, we all try to be nice. You're nice, you know, Ian. And I know you are objectively nice. very nice. People like you and they're right to. Uh, and you're nice and you try really hard to be kind to other people and thoughtful. And so um, it's ridiculous that people would say, because you're a conservative, you're therefore objectively horrible. Well, 
that's just sort of unthoughtful. And I was trying to bring him up on that, but I'm sure it- Great piece. Uh, question from Maggie, it's a Brexit question. What are your thoughts on Peter Mandelson's recent comments? People will have seen that, that essentially Mandelson, the you know, great uh, big figure of the new Labour era. Uh, and he said recently that if Remainers had spent more time advocating a soft Brexit, he means after 2016, let's say EEA or EFTA, rather than pushing for a people's vote uh, uh, second referendum, would we have a deal now? Would that have been a better way to, uh, to approach things? I mean, it's, fa it's fascinating this, as you get close to maybe having a, a Brexit trade deal or, or not, to see people you know, refighting this, relitigating this. Uh, to, to my mind, it was really kind of lost in the, the, the argument for a soft Brexit. The moment that Theresa May becomes prime minister, having voted to remain and then having to prove her non-existent Brexiteer credentials and having to out Brexit, Brexit the Brexiteers, it was sunk then. So I always argued that there were compromise solutions on Brexit that we were not seeking. I've n I was never sure actually that the EEA was re or that, that, that a single market solution was really one of them because I did I've always wondered about whether we could genuinely be part uh, accepting a load of rules that we don't set. And I thought that was you know, the both the whole point of Brexit, but also not really a credible way to govern ourselves. And I and I so I, I did wonder about that. But I, I certainly thought that um, the, the road that Theresa May wants to go down seemed to me a reasonable one and it was a reasonable compromise and I do think it was lost because because people refused to compromise it because they wanted a second referendum and I opposed a second referendum but tomorrow in the times I've reflected on what responsibility for the potentially quite hard Brexit we're going to get resides with those people and my answer is none the people who are responsible for the Brexit we're going to get are people who advocated it, not the people who did not advocate it. it always just drive me crazy when Remainers would, would blame David Cameron for Brexit. You thought, well, David Cameron wasn't in favour of Brexit. He opposed Brexit. He tried to tell the whole country not to support Brexit. Um, and it's not his fault that we are leaving the European Union. It's the fault of the people who proposed it and the people who voted for it, which wasn't me, right? Or if you think it's blame, by the way, or credit as well, because obviously it's a hypothesis that could turn out and the arguments for it, I understand completely, actually. Um, and there are strong arguments for leaving the Europe. There were strong arguments for leaving the European Union, but it's ridiculous. You know, Owen Jones wrote this piece and sort of basically blamed it on, on the kind of hard Remainers. Um, and I just think, while I thought their strategy was completely wrong, and I one of the reasons I thought it was wrong is because I thought they were withholding the loser's consent from the referendum result. But another reason is I thought it was likely to lead to a harder Brexit, and it has. But that harder Brexit isn't their fault because they're against it. Question about Boris uh, from David. Does he, a reference to the Falklands play, which was discussed recently, does he think that Boris will ever show the leadership qualities of three-time election winner, Margaret Thatcher. So there's a lot in there. Um, well, he is not. He's not Margaret Thatcher uh, in um, both good and bad ways. There were an, there was an awful lot that was um, incredibly impressive at Margaret Thatcher. And interestingly, I went through a project. You know this, Ian, and it's mentioned in a book of reading a biography of every prime minister since 1721. And uh, undoubt when you do that, you appreciate Margaret Thatcher really did belong to the front rank of great prime ministers, both in terms of her agenda, her leadership, the identification of the country with her, her longevity in office. Um, it was very impressive and, um, and I think essentially correct uh, in the circumstances she was in. Um, uh, once she completed her project, really, um, uh, you know, it began to fall apart and um, she didn't really know what to do next. Mm -hmm. And she should have understood that she should leave and didn't do the concern about anything a lasting disservice by deciding, and herself actually a lasting disservice by holding on when Dennis was telling her it's enough now. Um, and um, I think Boris will... Um, I think Boris will be less jarring. I think he'll be more consensual. Um, 
but I also think he'll be less decisive and in certain respects he will not be as great a prime minister as Margaret Thatcher uh, but not that many people will be. It's difficult to see him fighting another another two elections. Now we've got loads of questions we haven't got through just what I'm going to ask one last question just before I do uh, as reaction subscribers you have had an email and you'll get uh, a prompt to join there's a few tickets left for answer time which is the launch of our new um, show next week on the 15th and we have as guests we have Linton Crosby the election guru uh, for, the, for the Tories Caroline Flint former Labour uh, politician very interesting on Brexit and much else besides, and also by Justin Webb, the presenter of the Today programme. And we'll be talking about 2020, the year in review, economics. We might even mention COVID a bit, the state of political play and the US. So sign up for a free ticket as a reaction subscriber to join us for that. A last question, as the child of refugees from Maya, as the child of refugees, what are your opinions on the current Home Secretary? and her actions regarding asylum seekers. Um, well, okay, so I do think we have to have a firm and functioning um, immigration system uh, and that you can't simply accept every asylum claim. Uh, not everybody who is called an asylum seeker is seeking asylum. Um, but I have long been concerned about a number of things. One is um, the way that we treat asylum seekers when they come to this country. Um, the, uh, while they're here, um, uh, the legal system uh, as it relates to asylum seekers, both, uh, so there's a con conservative concern about judicial review and the fact that we can't get rid of people, but there's also my uh, concern about legal representation and um, uh, support for them uh, while they're here. Um, but I haven't, but I, my problems with um, Priti's uh, position have more been that I don't think she should attack legal representation um, and uh, I think that rhetoric is very unfortunate about activist lawyers I don't like it personally um, uh, and I worry that um, you know she may not address the problems in the home office that led to the Windrush affair which is definitely a stain on our um, mm. on our record as a uh, on our record as a country court you know the primary start of it not being lack of compassion but com grotesque incompetence right of letting a load of people in here without any kind of paperwork of any kind that you could then trace and then covering your tracks by blaming the people rather than yourself for the yeah. lack of uh, paperwork so um m my answer is um and then there's one other thing which is um you know i think the bullying uh, allegations are serious and the behavior is unacceptable um so there are there are uh but i worked with prissy um i I actually have quite a, a high view of her abilities. Um, I think she's got a lot of political appeal to people. Um, and I've always quite liked her personally. I've always got on with her very well with her. So, um, so it's a mixed bag of things, um, uh, my view. And I have some serious concerns about policy. One very quick final question, just because it was a good question sent in earlier that we didn't really, uh, we didn't get a chance to get to, which was someone who has read the book points out that there's a strong strand of pro-capitalism in the book but that it's a very it's a very interesting take you don't you you i'm i suppose quite evangelical about capitalism but you sit in very pragmatic practical terms i love that phrase you have about um the thing that always worries you about it well who, who's going to decide who's going to decide in the human resources department how many people should be employed in the twix factory yeah and it's so, it, it, so my, my view is um, there is nobody has developed a coherent alternative to capitalism that I can actually understand. You remember when you were at school and there's like a kid with the badges who's an anarchist and you like go, well, how does that work exactly? And you keep asking questions and they never give you an answer. They're still like that. Well, I, we're now, I'm now 58 years old. I still, what actually are these people suggesting we replace capitalism with? How does it work? How do people buy cutlery? Right? Um, uh, who does, and you know, my, my, what I call the Twix question, who, because this was brought on by, by 
Paul Mason writing in his book, you know, he basically thinks that the world in the future should be like Wikipedia. People will volunteer to do it. Well, they might volunteer to edit Wikipedia, but who's going to volunteer to work in the human resources department of the people who make the ink on Twix wrappers? Who works for them and who decides that? And you either decide that centrally, uh, in which case you get Stalinism in the end, right? Because you also need a secret police to enforce and it. And you need to eliminate private property. You yes. centralise it, in which case you get capitalism. Um, and um, so my view is that, that uh, Mrs. Thatcher, there is no alternative to that. And then there are a load of disciplines that come with it. Um, and so I, 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 um, I also happen to think it's proving all the time, you know, human beings are making immense progress, but you have to, you, you have, there are problems with capitalism because there's a free rider problems um, mm. of which the biggest potentially is climate change. Uh, but you can do all that inside a system that has incentives. Um, but I, I find it extraordinary that there is this vigorous life for this alternative to capitalism, uh, which has never once provided a concrete alternative to it that works. Every single attempt, for utterly obvious intellectual reasons, has been a complete murderous catastrophe. And every time you point that out, the people go completely bonkers. But it's not something I can leave alone, given what happened to my parents. This is not a theoretical issue. Yeah. If you if you if you um, abolish private property and you know you and you move down this route, you people will suffer for it in a very concrete way. So it's an argument that does have to be resisted until somebody you know people keep on promising to write this book that i'm going to read that's going to set it all out and you like varifakis or hilariously aaron bastani you know and amazingly enough aaron bastani hadn't solved the allocation problems of socialism I'm that extraordinary. Before, so. i was expecting him to you know if, if, if well, anyone turning, was going to do it it was bastani yeah, turning the pages ian expecting that the next page would <laughs> be the aha moment and it didn't come right and, what, and what, who is going to write you know what it doesn't come because it because i think intellectually it's simply not possible yeah. well danny finkelstein it's been fantastic brilliant book really really enjoyed it and uh, you'll all get an email um pointing you to where you can get signed copies but thank you very much for joining us uh, and uh, tune into the next reaction event thank you very much danny thank you